All right, welcome uh, to our uh, to this iMedia capstone presentation. So first, uh, we have our director, uh, Dr. Derek Lacaf, has a recorded message for us. So if you just hold on one second, let me share my screen and play that message for you. Thank you very much for coming today. Good evening, and welcome to the 12th annual exhibition of capstone projects from the students in the Master of Arts in Interactive Media program at Elon University. My name is Derek Lacaf, and I'm the program's faculty director. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce this very special event. Last July, these students arrived on Elon's campus, having decided to complete an intensive graduate program in the middle of a global pandemic. That alone should give you a sense of the ambition and dedication possessed by this cohort. They brought previous knowledge and skills in areas ranging from media arts to graphic design to Spanish language to dance choreography. Over the course of 10 months, they researched, designed, and produced a wide range of projects as they learned everything they could about the different domains of interactive media. This evening, the students are showcasing the most significant, ambitious, and personal projects they created in the program. These capstone projects began with intensive audience and user research, were designed to achieve specific goals, and were professionally produced and developed across multiple user-tested drafts and prototypes. As you'll see, the content of these projects is incredibly diverse and vibrant, but every capstone reflects a shared commitment to design principles and understanding of production process. I know you will enjoy these presentations, and I encourage you to engage with these projects and the students afterwards. Each of these polished projects is the endpoint of a long journey. Each student overcame different challenges and made hard decisions to bring an excellent project to fruition. And now, at the end, they're very excited to share these stories. Thank you so much, Dr. LeCalf, for introducing all of the people assembled to our iMedia class. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to some of the people that we're gonna be uh, hearing from today. All of these students in the iMedia class that we have here today are doing digital marketing strategy is kind of the theme of this panel. And so uh, this is the order that we're going to uh, go in and we're gonna hear from each student. They're gonna do their presentation. And uh, after each student, we're going to do a Q&A uh, that can be verbal or in the chat. So don't go to the Q&A section of the chat. Go to the, you can put in things to, to, into the chat. But just letting you know, if you put something into the chat, everyone can see it. But I'll be monitoring the chat. So if you don't feel like speaking up, you can definitely put a question into the chat and I'll pose it to the panelist. All right. So first we have Evie, Abby Bakel. Next we'll have Natalie Odani. Then we'll have Olivia James and then Meg Berica. So please uh, welcome Abby to the panel and please thank her for being here. Thank you, Abby, for being here and take it away. Thank you, Professor Trish, I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, let me just share my screen real quick and I will get started. Let me present that, okay, great. So like Trish said, my name is Abby Bakel, and my capstone project was a social media campaign that highlights the mental health and experiences of black female athletes at predominantly white institutions. Um, so it's called Embody the Melanin. Um, that's the name of my campaign and also all of my social media handles and um, the name of my website as well. So how it started, I um, started off playing sports in, all throughout high school and middle school, I started playing soccer in um, third grade, and I've experienced a lot of um, differences on the team, and I've had instances where I've been the only person of color on the team, and I've had a lot of struggles throughout that, and so I wanted to take my experiences and take my challenges and struggles and create a whole platform and create a place where people can be educated and also have this place for um, Black female athletes to have a safe space on social media that allows them to kind of take a break take a break and have um, a good positive mental space on social media because not all the time that's not the case all the time and I wanted to create that space for them so they can share their stories and kind of relate to one another. Um, this also came from a paper that I did in Dr. LeCaf's class 
in the first semester of our um, program, I focused on equality in social media and uh, female athletes. So from that, I took that and I narrowed it down to um, black female athletes at predominantly white institutions based off of the experiences that I've had um, playing sports all throughout my um, career. So then I created this social media campaign called Embody the Melanin. So melanin comes from the, the color of our skin. And I wanted to use Embody to kind of embody and empower all of the athletes that are highlighted and showcased throughout the um, campaign. So these are the four women that I decided to highlight and celebrate. Um, the first one right here, her name is Kyra. She went to Guilford. She just recently graduated in 2020. Um, she played volleyball at Guilford College and her friend right here, uh, Christian Ritter, she also played volleyball at um, Guilford as well. And she graduated um, last year. I'm sorry, Kyra graduated in 2021, not 2020. Um, this right here is Lauren Clark. She played softball um, at Elon. She's gonna be a rising so senior this year. And then this is Jasmine. She uh, also played volleyball at Guilford College. So I really loved working with these athletes, I did an interview with them and I also created highlight reels to showcase and celebrate their skills off the field. And throughout those interviews, they kind of just talked about their experiences of, you know, potentially being the only um, black girl on the team and how they were able to deal with any like racism or um, inequalities or anything that happened from teammates or coaches not understanding the black experience. So they were very open to talking about their time as a um, collegiate athlete and their experiences kind of having 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 to navigate through that and having the support of their team and friends like and things like that so it was great working with them I loved um, talking with them they were very open to me and we were very comfortable with each other which is what I wanted while creating um, this brand which yeah so that's what I did for that those are my girls that I started off the um, campaign I also wanted to brand my campaign as well. So I picked colors that would be um, kind of neutral and very, you know, calming and relaxing to the eye. This is about mental health. So I wanted to create colors that kind of not only showed off the melanin of our skin, but also showed off the calmness and relaxation of everything. And um, just kind of having a space where everything is calm and like, uh, easy to share and like a safe space for everybody. So this is the colors that I chose. Same with the logo, kind of same aspect with that. I wanted to create something that was calm and pleasing to the eye, something very small and very simplistic, but also very bold with the lettering because I wanted to really enhance the embodiment of our melanin skin and of our people um, and that, that are gonna be highlighted and same with like the fonts and stuff like that. So this presentation is all branded by my um, brand and also everything is logoed through uh, my photography and also my videos that I created. So anytime you see a photo or a video that is on my campaign, you'll see the brand. So you'll know exactly what it is. You'll see Embodied the Melanin anywhere and everywhere on social media, hopefully. Um, so some of the challenges that I had faced. So at first I had a lot of trouble finding subjects. Um, I sent multiple, multiple emails to Elon um, coaches and staff and same with Guilford and I got nothing. So I kind of went um, another route and asked some of my friends that went to Elon and some of my friends that went to Guilford to see if I can get some people to share their stories and talk about their experiences. Um, they were a little iffy at first because it is kind of hard sharing experiences like this because it's a really hard topic and, and um, they were kind of hesitant at first but once I kind of talked them through it, they were very excited about doing this. Um, so once I found my subjects, we were good to go. And then, you know, we're also in a pandemic. So sports have been hit not as hard as other um, departments, but they've been hit pretty hard. So I had trouble going to practices. Um, Guilford had a very strict rule that people outside of campus were not allowed cam on campus. So I had to kind of be creative and figure out a space where I can take my subjects and shoot them. So we ended up going to a park and shot volleyball um, one afternoon with them, which was really fun. And actually Elon, um, the softball coach was very great and understanding. So she let me come to one practice. I was still limited, but I was still able to come and join her while she was playing and get footage of her. Um, there was also an athletic policy that I did not, was not aware of coming into this. So I kind of had to work my way around that and find a find people to talk to and kind of explain to them what I'm doing. And once I got uh, more people on board, I was able to interview um, Lauren and she was very excited as well. So having her kind of like talk to people as well helped me really get the interview out and pushed really pushed for that interview because I think it's really important to share um, the voices of 
the women that are being um, highlighted in my campaign. So right now I will be taking you to the website. Let me get out of this real quick. And then, oh, thank you, Canva. So this right here is the website that I created. So I wanted to kind of show off their skills on the homepage. And here you'll see all of the women playing um, and kind of just in like a little short little clip that I created. And then I have a athletes page, which is right here where they're highlighted and all of their um, interviews and everything are on here. So I have a little blurb that I have from the interview that I took that really spoke out um, to each person. And then I introduced the player as well. And then I have kind of like photos that I have of them that were shared to me from Lauren and also um, the ones, some of the ones that I took. So I really wanted to capture her whole experience playing um, softball throughout her whole life. She's been playing since she was six and have had these struggles. So I've wanted to showcase that. And then I also created a highlight reel for her. And then I have the interviews clipped up on here. So the website is actually mainly a resource for coaches that don't identify as black and um, anyone that wants to learn about how they're able to create safe, safe spaces for their black female athletes. Um, so I created different resources based off of the research that I've done and also my experiences as well. And I created like a blog type um, write up for each coach, whoever wants to read through, um, they can kind of read through the experiences that I wrote up so they can better create safe spaces for their teams and also create spaces where um, there's no negativity or anything like that. And so for people that don't necessarily understand the black experience, they're able to read about this and able to better create um, places for their black female athletes. And next I will show you the Instagram page. So oops. This is where um, everything is going to be housed. So my target audience for the Instagram is black female athletes. And then my target audience for my website is um, coaches that don't identify as black. So they can use that as a resource. resource. Um, this is kind of like where the mental health aspect comes in. So I created little posts and within each post, you can see a little blurb that I wrote on some of the advice that I give um, to black female athletes in order for them to you know, really take care of their mental health and also to becoming more aware of their physical health as well, because sometimes I've heard different stories of, you know, not being able to take care of their bodies and stuff like that. So I definitely wanted to touch base on different things that I that have helped me in the past and that have helped the women that I interviewed as well. So I created this little page. I also put up their interviews on here so they can, so other Black female athletes can hear the stories that other people are sharing so then they can feel like oh we're not, I'm not alone or anything like that so they can hear that and get any advice from um, the women that I have created or uh, showcased on here and I will show you a small little highlight reel that I created for Lauren what I did something was unique with Lauren is um, she gave me footage from um, when she was younger so I was able to kind of put together some of that and showcase it with the footage that I took of her playing um, at Elon. So I'll share, share this quick little video for y'all. It's only a minute long. Let me turn this up. Sorry, it's loud. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that was just a quick little highlight reel that I created for Lauren. Um, like I said, one thing that was unique about her is that she gave me um, a lot of 
footage from when she was younger and I was able to put that together and she really loved that and it was something that was really cool and different for her. Um, I do want to go into sports, so something that I wanted to really push myself and practice with is creating highlight reels for different sports. Um, so yeah, so that's what I created with that. And then I do want to continue this campaign as well. Um, so what I want to do is really showcase a lot more athletes. Um, the highlight reels might be a little bit harder just because of the uh, like living situations, like being away from people. But I definitely want to continue to interview people and keep sharing stories that um, people are going through and like giving more advice to other people as well. And also continue with the mental health aspect as well. So I really want to embrace and embody all of the um, Black female athletes that are going through a lot of different things while playing at predominantly white institutions or just playing in predominantly white spaces and kind of just sharing their stories and also really highlighting the fact that we do sometimes struggle and educating people on how to better um, work with their players and how to better like assist them and be a support for them. So yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abby, for uh, sharing that with us. If anyone has questions or comments, thoughts, feelings for Abby about her um, her project, Embody the Melanin. You can put them in the chat if you would rather um, do it non-verbally, or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask her questions verbally. Um, I'm going to kick it off, uh, Abby. So during this project, you were talking about sharing experiences that you had um, through sport and are probably some difficult experiences. And then you're hearing probably some difficult experiences from the women that you interviewed. So how did you take care of your own kind of mental and physical health? I know it's part of your project to help others, but how did you help yourself with your physical and mental health doing this project? Um, it was hard. I remember, I think it was during Lauren's interview, I like teared up a little bit because I just was very, I wasn't surprised because I knew that like things were going to happen um, like that. Like we are down south and uh, Elon is a predominantly white institution. So I wasn't surprised, but it was kind of hard for me to hear those stories um, when people were talking about them. And it also kind of brought back a lot of memories that I had growing up too um, and not being able to know how to kind of deal with different things like that so I think I also just kept reminding myself like I've been doing a great thing like and all of my athletes too also told me like they thanked me like so many times for like creating this space and creating um something that where they can talk about all of these hard issues because they've like dealt with a lot of stuff and they don't know how to best um rep, like say share that those experiences and also they it's tiring it's very tiring to kind of like say it over and over again so I think creating this resource, I'm hoping it will help more coaches be aware of um, what they're doing and what they're saying, because a lot of the stuff can really hurt and really affect people. So hopefully, yeah. So just reminding myself that I was doing something good really helped me. <laughs> and I know you were talking about uh, continuing on the project. I was wondering if the, you might have a thought about in the future having a section that might be for younger um, younger for girls that uh, and and coaches of girls because like looking at that great archival footage of lauren if you're going to be a college athlete you're probably will have started playing you know when you're like four or five t-ball softball and um or whatever sport it might be and so i was wondering if you might have a section that might be more geared towards younger kids at some point yeah, I definitely um, have thought about that. I want to create it as more, because like I said, in the interviews, I always asked my um, athletes if they had any advice for other people. So I definitely want to create a space where it is targeted towards younger audiences so they can kind of like prepare and like know what to do early on so they can start practicing those skills like mental health stuff and self-awareness and self-care and like all that stuff. So then that practice can be in place by the time they get to college. And so when they get to college, they know how to kind of like navigate through different things. So I definitely, yes, we'll be considering that. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, we have a question from Dean Ford. She says, what did you learn about yourself and how did you grow through this project? Um, I learned a lot about myself. I am a big self-doubter. Uh, so I, coming into this, I had no idea how I was going to execute this uh, project. I was a little nervous um, coming in and I learned that I, I'm able to push myself and able to create things that 
are hard topics and I because I don't like talking about hard things because they're hard um, but I am able to create spaces where they are safe and I'm able to really like navigate and launch a platform like all by myself because I also like I'm very um, resourced if that makes sense I like to you know kind of lean on the stuff that's already been made out there and so coming in and creating this whole new thing that I haven't really found doing research on was kind of nerve wracking for me, um, but doing it in the end, I'm really proud of the work that I did. And I think I learned a lot about just, you know, pushing myself and growing in a space where I can really create stuff that is helpful and useful for people. Uh, again, if anybody has any um, questions the for Abby or for any of our panelists, feel free to put that in the, in the chat. So uh, Abby, going some people who are here might be potential future iMedia students and the capstone this is a huge part of your your experience with iMedia do you have any advice on capstone specifically for future iMedia students um my advice is I actually got this from Professor Motley is do something that you're going to be very interested in throughout the whole time because you are going to be working um, on this project for a very long time. So keeping a topic that's going to always interest you and always push you to create really great things is my thing because I loved the topic that I did and I never got tired of it. Um, it's just like having the motivation to like push through and like finish strong. Um, so definitely have something that you are going to love creating throughout the entire time um, because that really helped me because I just loved the work that I was doing and the people that I was working with. So having a good support system like friends and the subject that I had and as well as just picking a topic that you love. <laughs> Do you have any final uh, thoughts before we move on to the next one? I want to give you the floor if you like any final thoughts. I do not, but thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right. Next up is Natalie Aldani and Natalie, you have the floor. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining our Zoom room tonight. Um, today, I'm going to be presenting my capstone. Let me share my screen. Can everybody see? Yes. Awesome. All right. So for my capstone, I did did a dance docuseries and educational website titled What Moves You? And what this is, is a educational resource for young dancers that are trying to decide what they want to do for their professional careers. So um, just a little bit of a backstory on why I did what I did. Um, like Abby said, um, I did take Motley's advice, Professor Motley's advice about doing something that you were really passionate about for this project because it did take up quite a bit of our time. And I figured what better way to kind of end this semester and this program by marrying my love for digital design and videography with my passion for dance. So I've actually been a dancer since I was three years old and I have been teaching dance since I was 17 and I'm now 23. So dance has been a really big part of my life. But one thing that I feel like I personally experienced and a lot of other dancers experience is the lack of education that surrounds dance as a profession. It's not necessarily a traditional route to take. So um, when looking for external resources on how to decision make on how to necessarily kind of get into that career field, it's kind of difficult. Um, as we all know, um, public schools are kind of underfunded when it comes to the performing arts. So um, just it being a conversation in school, it, that wasn't really common. And um, as I said before, it's just not a very traditional um, route to take. So I really wanted to um, have this project be an educational resource for young dancers that are kind of stuck and wondering how to make their way into this profession and where to start. So my overall goals were number one, to educate, which is what I just said. Um, second was to visualize. So like I said, I'm very, very passionate about videography. So I was able to interview three different subjects um, and three different ages, and they're all in different stages of their dance career. Um, and they were able to give 
a lot of educated advice and their own personal testimonies of being in the dance industry and how it's kind of stigmatized. So it was really awesome to hear from them. Um, three, I have a resources page on my website, which I will show you guys in a moment. And that is aimed to guide dancers to different organizations that are certified in giving educational advice to young dancers when it comes to finances, keeping up with your physical appearance and um, your overall health, and also mental health as well, because that's a huge part of dance too. Um, and then four, and most importantly, I feel um, this project was really aimed to serve to continue the conversation. Because like I said, a lot of this misinformation and lack of education comes from the fact that it's just not a conversation that's genuinely had in the public school system and just in general. So yeah, these are my four main goals. Um, another huge part of this project was the branding and the design. And I got to design my own logo. So here you can kind of read a little bit of um, the intention behind the, my design choices. And you can see this obviously branded throughout my presentation and you'll be able to see that on my website as well. Um, I wanted to keep it fun, but also very clean and crisp because as you all know, my overall goal is to educate. So I didn't want anything too distracting. Um, I chose five brand words to motivate my editing style and also my overall design. And those words were bold, informative, empowering, insightful, and personal, because at the end of the day, this is a very personal project for me. Um, another way that I promoted the project was through social media, and I hope to continue posting. Um, this project will be an ongoing project for me. Um, I started off with bite-sized media pieces, and then I wanted to kind of expand into longer episodes for each of my three subjects, which you can see on the screen here. Um, and overall, I just want to get as much information to young dancers as I can. So um, I'm hoping that each episode will be around 10 to 15 minutes. So now I'm going to take you to my website. Alrighty. So here we are at my website. This is the home page. Um, I have a lot of call to actions um, because again, this project is very personal and I wanted to kind of grab people's attention. Um, so you'll see a lot of call to actions throughout the website. Um, through the home page, you can access each individual episode. Um, so each subject, like I said, is in different phases of their dance journey. Firstly, we have Annie Adams and she is 18 years old. Um, she is currently um, practicing at a dance studio and training pre-professionally and is gearing up to apply for college. Um, Jenna Kulatz, my second subject, is actually an Elon University native. She is majoring in dance performance, and we'll actually take a look at her video here shortly. And then lastly, I have Shannon McCarthy, and she is a seasoned dancer. She has um, been to school for dance both in high school and in college. She received her bachelor's degree from Chapman University, and her video is a Q&A style video so that dancers can get um, the most information from her because she technically is the expert in this aspect. So I have an about page, which basically just kind of gives you an overview on why I decided to do this project. Um, I have a meet the dancers page where you can kind of um, look more into each dancer's accolades. And then from there, you can press the button to their direct episode if you're just looking to specifically watch one person. And then last but not least, we have the resources page, which I talked about a little bit earlier on. Um, these are just filled with different dance organizations that people can actually directly click on and it takes them to the website um, and they can browse based off of what information that they need. And then at the bottom is just a simple contact form. So now just to close out my presentation, I'm actually gonna show you one of my episodes. Like I said, this is a work in progress. Um, I definitely wanna to continue to edit. Um, I want these dancers to have as much information that comes directly from the horse's mouth because these are all dancers that are actively dancing and in the industry, just in different shapes and forms. All righty, let's watch. I really have gotten a lot more confident in my abilities and I still struggle, that's for sure. There's times where, you know, I say I can never see myself the way I actually am as a dancer. I think a lot of people are like that. But for me in particular, I've had to have people tell me all the time, like, when are you going to start believing in yourself as much as I believe in you? And I really want to get to a point where I can always think that I'm a great dancer because I deserve to feel proud of myself. And I want to feel proud of everything I've accomplished. And that is my goal. <laughs> 
My name is Jenna Kulatz. I'm 23 years old and I'm a dance major at Elon University. I started dancing, I think at age maybe nine or 10, actually really, really late. I started at a recreational studio. So it was basically just like jazz, hip hop, that sort of thing. Um, wasn't super serious. It was more for fun. And then I started doing dance competitions, but then I realized that it was like something that I was really meant to do. And I was getting a lot of positive feedback from my teachers. And then I went to a dance competition actually, and I saw this studio and it was called Westchester Dance Academy. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I would do anything to dance like them. So I stayed at the other studio for another year. And then finally, when I was about 12, I said, okay, it's time for me to switch. I want to take my training more seriously. After that, I trained really hard and I actually like landed up being my teacher's assistant. It still isn't really real to me that like I left the studio having that much of an impact. It's really amazing that I have such a close relationship with my teacher. I've taught there actually now for three years and I plan to teach there after I graduate. So it's, it's a full circle moment, I would say. My career, I think, has been questioned for as long as I can remember. I think it's funny because when you're growing up and you say, you know, I do dance competitions and I do all of this stuff and I'm like a really intense dancer, people respect that so much. And it's so funny that how once you get into high school and you're starting to think about what you want to do in school, all of a sudden it's like, what are you going to do with a dance degree? And it's, it's so frustrating to me because to be at that level of training and to put in that much work and say you want to pursue dance in college is not an easy thing to do. And it requires a certain type of person. It drives me insane because people don't realize the academic part of it too, especially in a college dance program. I mean, a choreography class, you have to write a bunch of essays, do a lot of work on your own and research all these past choreographers. I mean, it's it's not just the dance too. It's, it's academics on top of the dance and reading and learning about the art form to help you as a dancer and help you as a choreographer and help you understand the history. I definitely feel like something that was missing in the public school system and missing in my life was resources and people that could talk about selecting the best performing arts program um, because a lot of it is based on academics and the and you know the big schools that everyone applies to and when it comes to dance programs or the performing arts a lot of the advisors or like guidance counselors you would talk to in school know nothing about it <laughs> so like you would tell them like i'm applying to this dance school and that dance school and they'd say great i like i can't help you i don't i don't know and so for me it was really hard because i had to just go by word of mouth and the experience of other people that have went to these schools which is really hard and I think can be a really sticky situation because what someone experiences is not what you might experience. So yeah, that is obviously a work in progress. Um, I was really, really excited to talk to Jenna just because she was here at Elon and I feel like experiencing dance in academia is such a unique experience in general. So it was really awesome to talk to her as well as the other subjects. Um, but yeah, that is pretty much it for my presentation. Thank you all so much for watching and I'm excited to see where this goes. So feel free to put questions uh, for Natalie in the chat or feel free to just unmute yourself and ask Natalie a question directly. So uh, now I'll, I'll start us off. Um, so the, the woman that we just saw, she did competitive dance, you know, she was with a recreational studio and then she went to competitive studio. Um, did you all discuss kind of like the, on the competitive side of dance, it really, really pushes your body. And especially for the, those extensions and things like that, that's really, really pushing you to the edge. Did you talk about um, injuries or kind of where her line is on how much she pushes her body? 
Yeah, we did talk about that a little bit. Um, however, that is like a huge part of why people ask if dancers have a backup plan. You know, God forbid they get injured. Um, a lot of people expect dancers to kind of have something supplemental in place. So um, we did touch on that a little bit, but I didn't want to focus too, too much on that just because that's like the first thing that comes to people's minds. I mean, you're bending your body every which way. It's very taxing on the body, like you said. So um, we talked about it a little bit, um, but her main thing that she talked about that I hope to incorporate a little bit more in her video is um, how people did put that expectation of her to have that backup plan. Um, and that she said kind of shaped her decision-making on um, coming into Elon and um, exploring a second major, but eventually just focusing on dance, so yeah. And uh, I know with our dance program here for our BFA dancers, they do a ton of coursework and like the dance classes, even though the dance class may only be one credit hour, mm -hmm. they are dancing so much more than that uh, every week. And so um, when she was talking about having the academics on top of that, because then, the, then you have the studies classes and theories classes, those are four credit hours. So you mm -hmm. have that. Plus, they're like, oh, it's just a one hour class, but it's not. They, they put in so much work, plus rehearsals for actual performances. Right. Um, did you touch on kind of like COVID times in dance uh, for this? Yes. She talked about her audition process, um, like for different pieces and how it was different and just like the culture of just going into the studio. Um, but again, I didn't want to focus too, too much on the COVID experience just because um, you know, hopefully in the future, like performing arts will kind of get back on their feet and continue to push on. Um, but yeah, she talked a lot about, um, like, as you saw in the video, her coursework that kind of accompanied her dancing, um, and how much effort she has to put into that as well. You know, you're writing papers, you're studying different choreographers and different techniques. It's, it's almost like two degrees in one because you're, you're fulfilling that degree physically with your body and your technique and what you're actually dancing. But then you have all this knowledge um, surrounding the dance industry that um, is accompanied by those classes. So like you said, like it could be an hour class, but mentally and physically, it doesn't feel like an hour class. It's actually a huge commitment. So um, I never, as you know, like I didn't go to, I didn't go to school for dance. I was just a competitive dancer growing up and a dance teacher. So that experience is completely different than what I know. So it was really awesome to be able to hear her experience firsthand on how she's kind of ventured through these years at Elon. And I also want to ask the Dean Ford uh, question. So the same question that uh, she posed to Abby earlier. Uh, what did you learn about yourself and how did you grow through this project? I learned a lot about myself through this project. Um, I think, you know, we all anticipated how tolling this project would be on our time. But I think kind of once we got thrown into it, we realized how much of a commitment it was and how little time we actually have to get stuff done. And that's why it's so awesome that we can continue these projects afterwards. Um, but for me, just kind of stepping into a more deadline based environment, um, was definitely very challenging for me, but in the best way, I feel like it's taught me a lot. Um, and then also similar to what Abby said about, um, kind of self doubting. I have a lot of past experience with not having a lot of confidence in my work, even though it could show otherwise. So being able to be proud of myself throughout all the different phases of my project was a lot different than what I have, you know, kind of experienced in the past with different coursework, but overall just being able to be proud of my work and know that, um, you know, I'm kind of speaking to my younger dancer self and any other dancers that were kind of in the same spot as me. So, yeah. And I hope that you all are proud of the work that you did. You all, all four of you have worked really hard for these capstones and thank you for sharing them with us. You should be really proud of everything that you've done. <laughs> so Natalie, do you have any uh, final thoughts? I wanna be able to give you the space to say anything that if somebody maybe didn't ask a question about that you'd wanna share? I don't think so. All right, thank you so much. Next up, we have Olivia James. Olivia, you have the floor. Thank you, Trish. All right, give me one second. I've got two monitors going and it's never good. Okay. Can you guys see this all right and hear me? Fantastic. Yes. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Thank, welcome to my presentation of my capstone project entitled The Green Room. My name is Olivia James and I'll be telling you a little bit more about my project and my process. Um, so the Green Room is a digital resource for dancers, parents, and teachers, keeping on the theme of dance in this session. 
um, to learn about and discuss the nature of injury in the dance community, particularly the mental health effects surrounding injury recovery. If you want to view the site as we go, you can feel free to search www.thegreenroom.dance um, and have a look through. So my goals for this project mostly revolve around community and building dance community. The dance community at large is very well connected in small pockets, but is also very disconnected um, between companies and dance studios. So there's not a lot of communication in person between these small pockets, but online communities are starting and continuing to grow. Um, as community is one of the main pillars of my project, I wanted to create a safe space for people to be able to learn and discuss mental health and injury, while also broadening the conversation around mental health in the dance community at large, especially on social media but also in the studio. I also wanted to provide resources for people taking some of the academic dance research and making it more accessible to people. So to go into a little bit of why I wanted to do this project, I've been dancing since I was two before I entered iMedia. I actually graduated with my BFA in dance performance and choreography from Elon last spring. Um, and in my junior year of college, I tore my ACL in the second week of school and really struggled with that recovery for nearly a year. Um, it was the longest I'd ever been out of dance and it took a really lasting toll on my mental health. And I noticed that most of the questions that were being asked of me in this recovery period really had nothing to do with my mental health, but were very focused on my physical health, which makes sense in dance as it is a very physical art form. Um, and it's felt as if people kind of expected a complete lifestyle change in my third year of college to not really affect me at all. And I discovered that this was not really a unique experience. Um, so at the beginning of this project, I conducted a survey that involved around 40 participants that asked about their experiences with injury within the dance industry. And most of my respondents were either college dancers or pre-professional dancers. And the results across the board were nearly exactly the same in their responses. I asked for both demographic and qualitative data about their experiences um, and found that 97% thought that mental health was not being addressed enough in injury recovery with that last 2.9% being that they did not know and that 100% of the people that I asked had been injured at some point in their dance career. It was really amazing to see how many people had a similar experience to me earlier. I believe Abby was asked about how this affected her. This really was amazing to see, but it was also really difficult. I had hoped that this was a unique experience to me and that other people were not feeling the things that I had felt, but um, injury can be very isolating and that as humans is a very universal, horrible feeling to have. Um, and a dancer's worth is really connected to their physical ability to their company and program very often. And many found that taking time off to let themselves heal both mentally and physically brought feelings of guilt and shame along with that. There's a culture of the show must go on that really encourages dancers to push through their injuries kind of for the sake of the art, even at personal and professional costs. Um, and then there, though there's a shifting culture within the industry, it's really easy to see a dancer as a body. And when you're injured, that body might not be seen as useful anymore, which causes these feelings of isolation. So from this survey, I developed a few personas that I then developed my branding and site map off of. This was really important in determining what I would prioritize as this project began with a massive list of things that I wanted to do. So I developed three personas in total, a dancer, a parent, and a teacher that informed most of my decisions for the branding of the site. So I wanted to develop the visual identity for this project, keeping in mind kind of the familiar shapes and colors and elements that you might see backstage in a theater. Um, dancers often work from feeling, so I really wanted to create a holistic brand that captured that, those feelings of comfort, safety, and community, of course. So green rooms, for those of you that are unfamiliar with maybe some of the theater terminology, are kind of an in-between room that often serves as a backstage waiting area. It's the between of the dressing room where you're getting ready and the stage where you're performing. Injury often puts you in the state of limbo, which is where I've got the name from. I also utilized a light bulb in my logo to mimic the often bare bulbs that you see backstage designed to give you the best light possible. So the image is not only familiar, but it also represents the illumination of this issue that I'm addressing. I really wanted to stay away from any kind of medical imagery that I could because I wanted to, again, promote that feeling of safety. So I developed this site on Webflow, which is a drag and drop HTML site that uses the conventions of code without requiring any code. 
and that presented kind of its own challenges, but I'll take you into the breakdown of the site just a little bit, and then we'll go through some individual elements as well. So this navigation is seven pages, not including the home page, that break down into smaller subpages. And just to take you through the guides really quickly before we go into some of the other elements. So they are pages of advice and serve almost as a checklist. Dancers really like structure, but it's not necessarily a to-do list. They give a loose starting point of advice that were gathered from interviews in that initial survey I conducted. And I wanted to create three separate sessions, one for dancers, teachers, and parents, because it's often really difficult to explain others your mental health as you're experiencing it. And having an outside understanding of how injury affects a dancer will hopefully create a more open and productive forum for these conversations. So this video shows you just a little bit of my site. Um, it gives a very general overview of the first three pages. So this is the home page, and then the learn page breaks down the three main topics that I base all of my content off of, which is dance, identity, and injury, because understanding these three are really important to understanding the use of some of the other elements on my site. And then this is the general about page that kind of gives you just a little bit more information about the site at large. And this would be the learn page. So I also developed some interactive recovery trackers that are available for download to type on or also to print. You can see me here clicking through one of the trackers. Um, I developed a daily, weekly, and monthly tracker for people to use depending on what works best for their schedule and for their injury. And they promote short-term goal setting as well as long-term goal setting depending on which one you choose. And all three of them include personal check-ins. So you're not only tracking your physical recovery, but you're also tracking how your mental health has changed throughout the recovery period. So some of the strongest feedback I received was the want of a forum, which just wasn't feasible with the scope of this project and the platform I was using. So instead I put it on Instagram at thegreenroom.dance. And this is a place that I will hopefully grow into more of a conversation area. Um, I've used it to promote some of the blog posts that I've posted, um, which there's only two up right now, but that is going to be a place for interviews, research and thoughts on the industry beginning this summer. And it's really my hope that this will kind of be that forum place that people wanted in the survey, um, but that just wasn't feasible on Webflow necessarily. So my future plans for this project are to hopefully grow the social media page and continue to post on the blog. I really want to get a variety of voices on there, not only dancers, but also people in kind of the general sphere of the dance industry as well, because they of course need to be included in the conversation. If we were to limit it to dancers, then nothing would ever really get done because dancers don't only talk to dancers. Um, and that's why I also developed the guides into more of a parent and teacher sphere as well. And I would love to just continue to grow this into a place where real conversations are able to take place. So thank you so much for hearing my presentation. You can again find the site on www.thegreenroom.dance or on my portfolio on my capstone page. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me here. Thank you so much, Olivia, for sharing that with us. Uh, Tommy Kapetsky has a question uh, for you from the chat. Beyond Instagram, have you considered other social platforms? I have considered Facebook to eventually grow into. There's a pretty large dance community on Facebook. I initially chose Instagram because it's the biggest visually based platform. Um, and there's a massive dance communities on there because it's really easily easy to share movement. Um, Facebook, I would say is kind of the second largest because it's also really easy to share media on. And I know I'm personally a lot of part of a lot of Facebook groups, but I wanted to start on Instagram because I knew that there was a community already there that was pretty well connected. And I was wondering the thinking about Instagram videos or um, uh, or TikTok videos even, there are so many dancers, you know, doing variety of, of dance on there. I didn't know if you thought about maybe kind of a hashtag to get people in and to kind of think about this movement. And you mentioned uh, your dancers seen as a body, like the hashtag, like not just a body so that dancers are seen maybe more as people. I didn't know if you had thought about uh, expanding it uh, that way as well. Definitely. Um, that's kind of in the works for the summer in terms of like a more solid social media campaign. I really wanted to focus on getting the site up and running and getting it looking and working how I wanted it to. 
And then once I grow a little bit of a community on Instagram to kind of start that more solid campaign and then expand out onto other platforms, hopefully as I get more people involved and interviewed and kind of aware of, of what I've been doing. And I have a question for actually for Olivia and Natalie, since you both were uh, looking at dancers, did uh, either one of you um, pursue or want to involve in the future male dancers? Absolutely. I know for my project specifically, I left it open to dancers in general and not necessarily singling out the male dancer or the female dancer or male identifying, female identifying rather. Um, because another thing I ran into with my project is that a lot of the dance communities on the internet are very sectioned off by style. So you have like ballet dancers and modern dancers and I wanted to kind of get rid of that um, denotation as well because from speaking only on my project, um, it is such a universal experience and doesn't matter what style of dance you're doing, you more than likely will be injured. So I was keeping mine kind of as general as possible, but I would absolutely love to include anyone who wants to <laughs> join me. Yeah, same here. I originally actually was going to have one of my subjects be one of my male dancer friends who actually has his own um, LLC and like travels around and choreographs. And um, I also wanted to diversify that group as well, but just with COVID and them living a little bit far away. Um, it just didn't work out the way that I had planned, but I second everything that Olivia said. I really wanted to kind of like break down any like kind of barriers that different styles kind of a lot to these dancers, because I do feel like a lot of people fall under only one bucket. Um, so I wanted it to be more of like a general experience across the board. But yeah, I had actually originally um, planned to incorporate one of my male dancer friends in the project, but it just didn't end up working out that way. So Sorry, Trish, I think you're- uh, When you were talking to dancers did uh, that have been kind of sidelined for injuries, did you find any parallels also being sidelined because of COVID? Absolutely. That's something that I really thought a lot about when I started the project, because I know when I, you know, when the quarantine started and when I, you know, was sent home from my program last year, it felt very similar, especially because you couldn't be around anybody. So that it's in and of itself was isolating. And then, you know, dancing in your bedroom is never any fun. So um, yeah, for sure. It's not something I necessarily included in the project because kind of like Natalie said, I'm hoping COVID will be over soon. So um, I didn't want that to necessarily have a place to live, but it definitely is something that I thought about and researched in the, that similar feeling of isolation and how we can combat that. And I know that like for sports, bringing back to Abby's, um, um, Abby's project, if you are uh, sidelined with an injury, you still like attend all the practices and sit on the bench while everybody's practicing, like every, you're there. Is that the same way um, for dancers? It depends on the, it depends. Yes and no, you can like, mm, okay. So with dance, you're definitely in a group, but there's less of a team element because you're working individually, but you're working in the same space as other people. So you're not all, all the time necessarily working towards the same goal. So I know when I was injured, I was allowed to attend class and just sit and watch. But after a while, that becomes really grating because you're just watching people do what you wish you could be doing and are just completely unable to do it. So that also kind of starts to eat away at you. So it because there's less of a teammate element there I think it is just a little bit different so like yes and no so I definitely want to have the Dean Ford's question in here which was uh what did you learn about yourself and how did you grow through this project I learned a lot about my creative process I think I've been able in this program specifically um able to draw a lot of parallels between my process of you know, web development and design with my choreographic process, which is what I spent four years developing in undergrad. And a lot of the things that really tripped me up in my choreographic process would trip me up in my design process um, because I'm very much, I never go with my first idea. I have to go with it, start it a little bit and then like figure it out along the way, which is fine, but not when you're on a time crunch or when you have a whole semester to do it. So I definitely 
have some things that I learned about me and my creative process that I would change next time around if I were to do a project like this again, um, mostly in like the order of the things, but definitely a lot about how I work with myself um, because it's really rare, I think, that you get to do a solo project of this size. Great, thank you. Yeah, we love to have uh, people from all different backgrounds who are all different majors in undergrad to come because everybody brings their own perspective and their own background and it really helps the whole group, I think. Mm -hmm. So Olivia, I wanna give you the floor if you have any final thoughts. I do not, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, please can everybody give this extra round of applause to Olivia. She organized this whole capstone for not just this room, but for all of the rooms. So extra thanks to Olivia for organizing everything. All right, next up we have Meg Barica. And you have the floor, Meg. Thanks Trish, let's see if I can get this to work. Everybody can see things clearly, perfect. Hi everyone, uh, today I'll be presenting to you a bit about my capstone research. Don't forget to subscribe, research and campaign strategy for Twitch streamers. Now, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the site, Twitch is a live streaming platform that gives audiences and streamers the ability to connect in real time, which is really exciting. It's highly interactive and it provides multiple points of engagement for audiences which not only caters to the millennial and Gen Z need to be multitasking all the time, but it also gives audience kind of a personal stake in the content that they're watching. As well, streamers get real-time feedback for the content that they're producing, which really helps them improve and cater their content to the audiences watching. As well, it's provided a community in a very isolating time, especially during this past year in quarantine. And in fact, during COVID-19, Twitch has actually seen a 50% increase in audience space as well as averaging about 1.6 million hours watched per month. And that number is sustaining and still growing as well. As audiences have been coming to the platform, so has new streamers. But the problem is since Twitch has seen such a recent growth, there hasn't really been a solidified streaming practice that has been created on the site. And a lot of streamers rely on virality in order to make it. And most people are using this as a primary or secondary source of income, which probably isn't the most stable way to, you know, get that daily income. So my research really looks at both the interactive qualities as of Twitch as a site, as well as some of the trends that trailblazers on the site have created to create a campaign strategy for pre-professional st Twitch streamers to better their streaming practices and really encourage that audience engagement. So my research had three main goals. First, under what circumstance is a solidified strategic approach to streaming effective? Does this campaign work? And if so, what does it affect and how does that change the practices? Next is how can the established campaign be manipulated to meet individual streamer needs? Twitch offers a variety of categories to stream under, such as video games or some talk shows, even art. And so I really wanna make sure that this campaign is flexible enough to meet all streamer needs. And then finally is how can a campaign be communicated to support meaningful decision-making for a streamer? This campaign took place over an eight week period of time, and I wanted to make sure that the streamers that worked with me were able to take these lessons and continue the practices on afterwards so that they can see growth in it over a long period of time. So I created a campaign strategy, which is pretty exciting. And this campaign strategy was really rooted in the five main problems that I was seeing often in pre-professional streamers on the site. First is that internal content improvement. I wanted to make sure that the streamers who worked with me knew the basics of what makes Twitch so unique, how to use their individual components to make sure that they're, they had a foundation to build upon. Things like making sure you had lights and a good camera and how to record audio, really making sure that again, they had a solid foundation to build upon. Next was that channel branding, making sure that they knew who their target audience was, how to reach them and what made them unique on the site. This was displayed both verbally through their broadcasting skills, but also internally and visually through any sort of overlays or channel branding seen on both Twitch and any other platforms that they use to organize their content. Next was that stream planning. And this isn't just streaming at a regular time each day of the week, it's taking advantage of those offline hours to make sure that the streamer was prepared for the content that they're producing live. 
like I mentioned before, Twitch is a live streaming platform, so audiences aren't really coming back to watch pre-recorded content. And that's where that secondary platform use comes in. Using sites like Twitter and YouTube is great to engage with audiences during your offline hours to make sure that your channel is staying in that front of mind awareness. And then finally is that community networking, both making an internal community since again, Twitch audiences have a nice personal connection with the streamer, which is what makes it so interactive, but also making sure that you're building a network with other Twitch streamers and other trailblazers on uh, your channel's category to make sure that you have a network of people supporting your content and promoting your content. Like I said, this campaign took place over an eight week period of time and was separated into three main sprints. The first sprint was about that internal channel improvement, that content branding and that content improvement. Some of the ways I incorporated this into the streamer's channel was starting with an opening panel, which was also used maybe as a be back soon or a see you later, which is a great way to interact with audiences when you may be away from your computer. It takes a bit for that notification to initially coming out. So that starting soon gives an opportunity for audiences to join while also still being engaged with content. I always recommend to make sure that you have some sort of highlight reel, showing yourself off as the best during, again, those times when you're away from the computer because streams usually act, last between six, four to six hours, which is a pretty long time. So you're probably gonna need to step away from the screen for a bit. So making sure that there's still content being shown to engage viewers is a great way to maintain that average viewership. Stream overlays are also a great way to both promote your visual brand but also inform audiences of what kind of content you produce. As you can see, the way a Twitch stream is set up is you usually have one main screen of content with a micro screen in the corner, usually showing the streamer and some sort of overlay that has your channel's branding and any sort of necessary content you want. This may be a subscriber goal so that your audiences are working together towards a common goal. And as you can see, the Twitch streamer I worked with did a lot of competitive games. He participated in a lot of tournaments. So I wanted to make sure that those scores were still presented so that any audiences joining midway through the stream were still informed about what was going on and could engage with the chat as well. And moving on to the chat. The stream chat and the channel words are a great way for the streamer to be able to interact with the audience, which is one of the things that makes Twitch so unique. You wanna make sure that your chat is a productive environment because it's the internet and you need some sort of moderation. So I always recommend to my streamers, make sure that you're keeping an eye on that, both to have that personal relationship with your community, but also to make sure that you can monitor any unwanted participation. And then finally, that channel rewards, you get nice little stream points, which is a great way to reward audience members for engagement and participation. These are earned over viewership hours. And so you can actually use these points to engage with the streamer. Things like posture check or you know whatever it may be, something that's personalized towards your relationship with the community. So I always encourage my streamer to make sure that you have achievable goals for audiences so that they want to participate, they want to earn those points so that they can spend it to have some sort of personal interaction with the streamer at play. Now the next sprint is all about networking. I always recommend for my streamers to start with events and tournaments because this is where like-minded viewers can be reached. And standing out in these, ex in these existing communities is a great way to also show your professionalism as a streamer. Say you want to be the best at a game, I always recommend go to a local tournament. There's a ton across the site and it's a great way to pull in viewers who already have a pre-existing interest in the content that you're producing. Next is that collaboration, which both goes towards building a community internally, but also building a network of like-minded Twitch streamers. Collaborating with another Twitch streamer is a great way to give their audience a free trial of what your channel can offer, which is great because they might not know whether or not they like the content that you produce, but this is a great way to hopefully get a new range of viewership. And then finally is that community building, and this leads a little bit more into that secondary platform use. Finding out where people are talking about the game that you play is a great way to bring them over to Twitch and say, hey, you like this game? Check out my channel and I can show you what I got. So the final sprint is all about expansion, which isn't always the easiest on Twitch because the audience like repetition. They don't like change. They want to go to their Tuesday stream where they see a certain streamer at a certain time playing a certain game. So following a new trend or expanding your content 
isn't always the easiest thing in the world. I always recommend a strategy of introducing segmented content, something old with something new. So you can slowly introduce that familiarity with your audiences while still staying on top of the trends that are present in the Twitch community. So as a result, my campaign had increases across the board, but there's three main stats that I want to highlight. First is a 71% increase in subscribers. In order to be a subscriber on Twitch, you have a monetary payment that is a monthly donation to the streamer. And this starts around five or $6 and increases from there uh, into tier two and tier three subscriptions. So it was great to see viewers converting into donors across this campaign. Next was a 122% average increase in viewership. So not only was the streamer able to get new viewers, but they were able to sustain them over the eight week period. And then finally is that 14% increase in followers. The streamer I worked with already had a large uh, follower group. And so it was great to see an increase in, the, in that follower group, but also that conversion to donations. So just to close everything out, I have completed this campaign with now two different streamers. It has been great to see the growth across both platforms. And I hopefully will continue this campaign trial just to really make sure I can solidify that second research goal of making sure that this campaign is flexible enough to meet streamer needs. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat, ask them away. Uh, but also, you are more than welcome to reach out to me at my email, my.berica at gmail.com. Thank you. So just like Meg said, if you'd like to put a question in the chat, feel free. Also, you can just unmute yourself and ask her a question directly. Meg, I have so many questions. Okay. <laughs> Tell me some things about Twitch. First of all, when somebody does a subscription, are they subscribing to Twitch? Or are they subscribing to the streamer? Does like does Twitch get most of the money or does the streamer get most of the money? So the streamer gets most of the money. Of course, Twitch gets a small portion of that because we love capitalism. But so the streamer gets most of that money and actually the audiences do get rewarded for that donation. So they usually get some unique access to content. They get emotes, you get a nice little badge next to your name. So it's kind of wearing that personal pride, almost like buying a jersey for your favorite sports team. Uh, you really get to kind of show off your personal connection, and that will actually show up in other channels as well. So you gotta you gotta flaunt your your patronage. And when you uh, do that, um, you get access to live streams. But do is there also on demand uh, streams that you can watch things later, or is it only live events? There's a little bit of both. So all streams are free to watch initially, except you have some, you have ad breaks just as you would on YouTube until you subscribe. There's also, you, you kind of have a choice. You can offer your pre-recorded streams, anything that you've promoted. You can keep it archived on your channel for free access, but some people are actually do a paywall. So you have to subscribe in order to see those past broadcasts. Yeah, because I'm wondering about the, the future of this because your know, network televisions wanted all of you to watch live television and everybody is switching over to the streamers mm -hmm. where they can do it it's like an on-demand sort of situation in the Netflix, exactly. Hulu, Amazon, exactly. So I'm just wondering if like Twitch has figured out this other way of going I about it and getting live eyeballs like mm -hmm. event Tuesday night Twitch. Exactly. Like they have, they have tournaments, which is really exciting and they'll actually do game shows. There's a lot of opportunities. And so not only do you get to watch that live content of your favorite streamer, but the nice thing is you actually get to interact with the content that you're seeing. So it's not just watch this sports event that's a little bit of a two hour delay. It's everything's happening right in that moment. And say, I donate $5 to Olivia James. A little notification will pop up with my username and Olivia will be, hey Meg, thanks for the $5. So you really have a personal kind of parasocial relationship with that streamer, which gives the audience almost a personal state. And it also builds a lot of brand loyalty, which companies are slowly figuring out. And they're like, ooh, streamers are great influencers. Uh, during COVID, uh, my, my, my only experience with Twitch is that uh, bands were playing live on Twitch uh, during COVID. So these are bands that you couldn't play at clubs anymore with COVID restrictions. Um, and so bands would play Kind of distance from one another with masks but then do a twitch stream and they were able to do that and you know the chat would go and so people could comment 
um, you know, all throughout the, the show, which was great. Okay, we've got a uh, question from Joho. Did you see an increase or interest in advertising with sponsors or other companies, orgs, or groups? I did not in particular with this streamer, uh, but it has shown up in a couple of other research that I have done. Companies still don't really know what to do with Twitch because there's an outdated opinion on Twitch that it's just for gamers. And even in that sense, even though the millennial and Gen Z are, are technically the gaming generations, I think about 80% of those generations have played games or still interact with games. Companies still have this outdated view that gamers don't really go out. They stay in their home, they're antisocial, they don't really commit to society, which is probably the exact opposite. If you've noticed a lot of companies are trying to gamify everything because that's what the new generations want. They want a highly interactive platform. And so, companies are still trying to figure out what to do with Twitch. And so I, I think there is a slow migration. Um, it is owned by Amazon. So there, there has been an increase in sponsorships and a lot of companies are looking for those influencer opportunities to reach the market. Uh, but in particular with my streamer that I worked with, uh, he was approached by a couple other internal groups within his gaming category, uh, but no sponsorships from businesses quite yet. So as you can see, there's a couple of comments that kind of are, are interlocked in the comment section. So uh, Jordan uh, T. Robinson was saying there are also new communities entering on Twitch, specifically artists, designers, and craftspeople. And Haley Murdoch kind of was asking the question that Jordan seems to be answering. And also what you just answered, uh, is, there, uh, is it biased towards gamers or is it opening up more to musicians, artists, and creators? It's definitely still nominated by gamers for the most part, but is opening the door. I actually think one of the most viewed categories on Twitch is just talking, which is almost more of a talk show than anything else. Again, there is that large body of musicians on the platforms. Chefs are coming to go have cooking classes. I think I've even seen church streams during the pandemic. So Twitch is really growing in the opportunities that it offers to streamers. And it's more than just a site for gamers, which is what it did start as. Um, so again, it still kind of has that original um, viewership. Uh, does Twitch have anything on the technological side that would make it a better streamer than a Facebook Live, a TikTok Live, an Instagram Live? Yes. Um, both the inner engagement opportunities for audiences is better. I also think in terms of any sort of donations, Twitch does kind of have a universal currency that they use which is a great way to sponsor your favorite streamers and make sure that they're getting the money you see. As well, Twitch has a really great analytic system on the back end side of things. It makes it really easy for starting streamers to both see how to stream, it's easy to use, but they also get to see who their viewership is, what are they watching, what other channels are similar, what games are they interested in seeing, what times they're more often to view your channel, um, so it gives you very, very detailed reports on your stream, which I think gives Twitch the advantage right now. And again, it also, it does have that, that younger demographic as well um, to really, really target well. And I definitely want to ask the Dean Ford question. What did you learn about yourself and how did you grow through this project? So I, I knew nothing about Twitch before I started this project. Uh, I was very, very new to Twitch and I saw it and I was like, you know what, this, this is it. Uh, I started, you know, of course, with Dr. LaCasse, good old lit review. And I was like, I'm incredibly interested. It's something new. I would love to spend some time learning about it. And I just got sucked into the platform. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's all I've talked about for the past year. So I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about how much I really enjoy working with a client, having that personal relationship with the, the project. It was terrifying and very hands-off for me because I made the campaign. I gave it to my streamer. I was like, here are my recommendations. Meet with him weekly to see how he can incorporate it in his streaming practices. But then it was on him to see it from there, which is nerve wracking when that's your, that's your graduate capstone research. Um, but it was also, it was really, really exciting. And, and I'm really glad that it, it did work out well for the streamers that I've worked with. 
We do have a question for everyone about where can you find more of your work? If everyone wouldn't mind maybe sharing their portfolio or um, some sort of contact information in the chat so that um, all, the, all the people who are here could see more of your work someplace. So Olivia, sure would, you mind, would you mind sharing the link to the website? Um, all of our portfolios as well as links to our projects are all on the um, iMedia Capstone website. I think Olivia is going to do that right now. So she'll put that on there and then you'll be able to see everybody's. Oh, Tommy got it up there already. Thank you, Tommy. Any other final uh, thoughts, Meg? I want to make sure that you have the floor to give any final thoughts. Um, these are some brilliant ladies I was able to present with and congratulations to all of you on iMedia, we made it. Woo. Congratulations. Uh, like I said before, you should all be really proud of the work that you have done. Uh, any final thoughts from uh, anyone else on that has attending the panel? All right, look for look for these women in the future. Thank you very much for attending. We really appreciate everyone coming to support our wonderful iMedia students. Have a good night.